About a century ago, a Scottish pastor was quizzing his confirmation class about their understanding of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. By the way, when I was in confirmation class, I had to memorize all 107 questions and answers. Glad I did. Not then, but now I am. Well, he turned to one little lad and said, son, do you understand the catechism? The little boy replied, yes, sir, I do. Every word. And it didn't mean a thing. We've spent almost a year and a half as the Apostle Paul has gone to great heights and depths and lengths and breadths to expose you and me to the wonders of the gospel of grace and who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus Christ. And now Paul in verses 12 through 16 is going to raise the big so what question. Okay. You've seen what I've written in chapters 1 through 11, and you go, well, that's great, I believe all that. But Paul's going to now turn to you and me and say, so what? What is that going to mean in terms of how you and I live our daily lives? You know, there's a popular slogan bandied about the American church today, but it's totally fallacious. But it sounds really good. It goes like this. Doctrine divides mission unites. In chapters 12 through 16, Paul is going to work overtime now against that, to remind you and me that duty really does derive from doctrine. That it's creed that ultimately produces character. And that behavior is based upon belief. If the gospel of grace is true. How then shall you and I live? We begin to answer that question this morning by turning in our Bibles to Romans chapter 12, and we're going to take a look at the first two verses of that chapter this morning, and I invite you to pray with me before we read. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds now to your word, that we might clearly understand it, that we might gratefully receive it. And that we might faithfully apply it to our lives, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now hear God's word addressed to you and me, beginning to read at verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Please pray with me again. And now, Father, as my words are true to your word, may they be taken to heart. But as my words should stray from your word, may they be quickly forgotten. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. What is the most pervasive heresy in the American church today? Well, it happens to be the same one that was most pervasive in the church of Paul's day. And that is the heresy of Gnosticism. Gnosticism basically says that in life and in faith, what is really most important is what is spiritual, not physical. That what you and I believe, our faith, doesn't have to be connected to our everyday lives. Indeed, how you and I use our physical bodies doesn't really have anything to do with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Well, Paul, in verse 1, completely blows apart that heretical way of thinking. And he says, if the gospel of grace is true, if God is who really says he is, if Jesus has really done all that I've laid out for you in these 11 chapters, then it's very important 
that you bring your bodies into that mix. That it's impossible to separate spirituality from physicality. That is not the way God has designed you and me as human beings. It's not the way, it's not the faith that he has called you and me toward. And so being a Christian means that our physicality, Paul is going to say how you and I respond to the gospel of grace has everything in the world to do with how you and I deploy our physicality. And so in verse 1, he uses the word bodies. It's a word that means our physical bodies. But it's a word that Paul uses in such a way to mean more than that. He's, by using that word bodies, he's saying our faith either involves the totality of our being or it's not authentic faith. Another way of saying it, he's saying in order for you to follow Christ, you've got to offer yourself, your bodies, the totality of your being to God as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Can't separate body from spirit. It's all of one piece. A living sacrifice. Now, now what does that mean? Well, a chicken and a pig were walking down the road together one day, and they passed by a church, and they saw a big sign on the church front lawn that said, bacon and egg breakfast this Saturday, proceeds to help the poor. And the chicken says to the pig, let's help the poor. Let's, let's make a donation to that breakfast to help the church pull that off. And the pig says, that's easy for you to say. For you, that's just a contribution. For me, that means total commitment. <laughs> and that's what Paul means by living sacrifice. The totality of, our, totality of our beings offered to God. Now, there's only one problem with living sacrifices. Let me use myself as an illustration. I'm just being honest with you. I have given the totality of my life to Jesus Christ. I, I have brought all of who I am underneath the lordship of Christ and under the authority of his word. But you know what the problem is with living sacrifices? We crawl off the altar. That's me. I'm continually crawling off the altar. There's not a day that goes by that I don't have to intentionally recommit myself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Sometimes multiple times during the day. I'm on the altar, off the altar, on the altar, off. Following Christ is hard. Being committed to Christ is difficult. Being a living sacrifice, man, it will wear you out. Someone has said that the Christian life hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and not tried at all. And so many of us just shrink back and compartmentalize our faith. And we're Christians on Sunday, but the rest of the week we just kind of live our everyday lives, sometimes as practical atheists. Paul here is calling for you and me to be all in. He's saying you really can't be a Christian unless you're all in. You know, we have those phrases, nominal Christian or inactive Christian. Aren't, aren't those really oxymorons? Sometimes we look at somebody and we go, wow, he or she is a committed Christian. I mean, isn't that a redundancy? I, I, can you be a non-committed Christian? And Paul is defining committed here by living sacrifice, presenting your bodies, the totality of your being, being every facet of your life, to Christ. George Barna and his research group, they're studying the Christian church all the time. And their studies over the years 
unfortunately, are showing the same thing over and over again. That my lifestyle and yours really don't look any different from the surrounding pagan culture. When it comes to things like divorce and abortion and pornography and how we spend our money, and um, we don't look any different. And so Paul goes on in verse 2 to say, don't be conformed to the world. I, I love the J.B. Phillips translation of this. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. And folks, that's exactly what the world is doing to you and me 24-7, 365. Sometimes we don't even know it. We're being bombarded 24-7 by media that are subtly trying to get us to be squeezed into the world's mold. And the world's mold is pretty simple. It says you're the most important thing in the universe. Therefore, if there's something you want, partners, possessions, power, go for it. The world is telling you and me that truth is determined by popular opinion, that your faith can be and ought to be disconnected from your everyday life. Oh, Jesus is quaintly nice, but leave him at home or leave him at church, and don't you dare say he's king of kings and lord of lords and the only way to salvation. And the world's mold is squeezing you and me so that we're not just tolerant, but that accepting of any kind of sexual lifestyle. And all of that is just, you can separate that from your faith. You need to get along to go along, and if you don't, there's a price to be paid. And so Paul says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. Paul, in this text, Paul's really saying there's really only two ways that you and I can live our lives. We're either going to be conformed to the world and its standards, or he says, you can live with the antidote. And that's to let yourself be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Once again, we see here, you can't separate mind from body. Spirit from body. It's all of one piece. But what does it mean to be transformed by the renewing of your mind? What does it mean to really be all in? True story. Wee Bobby was a poor Scottish lad. He was in church one Sunday, and they were passing the offering plate. He had nothing to give. Felt really bad about that. So when the usher handed him the plate... He didn't know what else to do. He stood up, stepped out in the center aisle, put the plate on the floor, stepped into it, and said, I give myself. That's all I have to give. Now, that's more than just a, a cute little story. The Lord honored wee Bobby's generous gift. The Lord took wee Bobby seriously. We Bobby would grow up to be Robert Moffat. And he and David Livingston would become living sacrifices for Christ by becoming the first two missionaries to go into the interior of Africa. And with them, they took the gospel of grace. And they loved on the people there and told them about God's love. The result? There are vastly, vastly, vastly more Presbyterian-type Christians in the interior of Africa than in all of Scotland and the U.S. put together. Here on this Memorial Day weekend, when we recognize those who have paid the supreme sacrifice so that you and I might be free to gather in a place like this, this text on this Memorial Day weekend is calling you and me to a sacrifice much more important, more vast, more world-transforming than that. And that's to become a living sacrifice for Christ. And that's done by the renewal, being transformed by the renewal of your mind. And the, the word Paul uses for transformation there is the Greek word uh, metamorphosthe. 
from where we get our English word metamorphosis. Remember third grade science? You learned how caterpillars metamorphize into butterflies. When you and I are squeezed into the world's mold, we wind up, even for Christians, crawling along the low road while the butterflies soar above us. But you and I can soar, Paul says, when we allow God's Holy Spirit to transform us, metamorphosize us by the renewing of our minds. Again, mind cannot be separated from action. Well, how do you and I renew our minds? Our minds are renewed when we begin to think like God thinks. Where in the world would we, how can we do that? How in the world can you and I begin to track with the mind of God? Where would we go to do that? Right here. This is why I challenge this congregation, every congregation I've served, to read through the Bible with me every year. Not to be a pious exercise. Not a bucket list thing to check off. Reality is the world is squeezing you and me because it's speaking into our lives all the time via media and much of it we don't even realize how much we're being seduced. If you don't have God speaking into your life over and against that, your mind, your body, everything else is a sitting duck to be squeezed into the world's mode. When you and I immerse ourselves in the Word of God, then we begin to track with how God thinks. When that happens, Paul elsewhere says, something occurs in your life and mine. We begin, he says, to have the mind of Christ. And when you and I have the mind of Christ, that changes our behavior. We begin to act like Christ. And when you and I begin to act like Christ, a lot of times we don't even know we're doing it. Guess what happens? Jesus becomes visible to the world around us. Now, I've got to give you a warning here. <laughs> you start acting like Christ, you might be crucified someday. That's got to be truth in advertising here and let you know there, there can be some consequences to that. And then there will be. Even short of that, the world does not like you to break its mold. But that's what call, Paul calls us to do, to break that mold. Let the Holy Spirit break that mold. We can't do it by transforming our minds, beginning to think like God. It only happens when you and I put ourselves under God's word and let him speak into our lives over and against. Otherwise, we wind up culturally captive, which is what's largely happened to a lot of the American church today. And Jesus remains invisible. This Memorial Day weekend, I would encourage you to exercise your freedom. You can have that mold broken. Ask God to give you and me the mind of Christ, that people might see how we live and be drawn to the only Savior. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.